Um, so what I'm going to do uh, today is uh, give a little bit of history um, about uh, well the use of statistics and data in uh, in pandemic uh, situations. Uh, then I'm going to talk a lot about statistics, of course, uh, no formulas. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, a scandal uh, to spice it up a bit and. Um, well, I was asked to give some future perspectives also because this is the last lecture. So this is what I'm going to do. Um, so going back, um, using statistics in pandemics is not something new. Uh, here you see the Bill of Mortality, uh, which was published in 1664. Um, and it, it lists causes of death uh, during uh, the plague. You can see things from uh, a stopping of the stomach to fever or killed accidentally with a carbine as uh, causes of death. And this was actually uh, done by uh, Paris clerks in London. So what they did was they made this paper uh, with these mortality figures for the 130 parishes that were at that time in London, uh, listing all these various, various uh, causes of death. Uh, and it was also lucrative. So they, it brought some money for, for the church. Um, but besides it being interesting, uh, it's of course one of the first, probably the first, early warning systems for disease outbreaks. That makes it very interesting. So Forward, 150 years later, we uh, meet Florence Nightingale. And Florence Nightingale was uh, a nurse, but uh, foremost a famous statistician. Because she's the creator of this, which is called the uh, Oxcomb diagram. I had to look it up. Um, and this is probably one of the first uh, data visualizations ever uh, produced that was so very clear. It um, probably uh, wouldn't uh, be wrong to, uh, to see this kind of visualizations in articles today. And what is interesting, this is, this is data during the uh, Crimea war, uh, and it shows the, the cause of death. And uh, what you can see is that actually poor hygiene, which is the blue, uh, was much more important than bullets. So causes of death during the war in the army were primarily due to, to poor hygiene. This is what she, she uh, showed. Um, at the same time, uh, we have Jon Snow. And if I say Jon Snow, most of you will think about uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, but of course, I'm talking about the right Jon Snow, the 1800s Jon Snow. Uh, it's the guy on the right. Uh, and he is actually the founding father of uh, what we now call epidemiology, or at least he's, that's how he is uh, perceived. And he became famous for this, uh, which was um, a pump, a water pump. Uh, and actually he traced a cholera outbreak in London, uh, in the neighborhood of Soho, back to this pump. And now, of course, it's a, a tourist attraction uh, rather than a, a real water pump. You can still uh, find it. And what he did, he was, he actually made a, a very nice map, a very famous map. And if you zoom in a little, what you can see is that around Broad, Broad Street, that's where the pump is located, uh, you can see uh, the highest numbers of death very close to the pump. So if you have some modern interpretation of that, uh, it looks like this. And you can see the other pumps, uh, the black with the golden circle in it. You can clearly see, uh, well, good evidence that this one pump is indeed uh, the source, which is again, something uh, with, we're talking about uh, 200 years ago, uh, something very uh, innovative. So this very short history lesson, which is, uh, I'm not a historian, I'm a statistician, um, is nothing new uh, about the use of data and statistics to prevent, understand, and forecast communicable diseases, uh, diseases that spread. 
Um, and then, of course, well, we all know we, we've all been affected. We're still affected by it. Came the coronavirus. Uh, and just a, a little uh, update uh, or a, a little timeline just to, to uh, make you remember. Uh, it all started in, uh, at, at least for, for us Europeans, it started probably at the 31st of December uh, in, in, in last year when the WHO reported a cluster of cases of pneumonia in Wuhan, China. It took another two weeks before it, uh, it, it hit Thailand, uh, another two weeks to hit Italy. We all know what happened to Italy afterwards. Um, and it took uh, almost a month until the first confirmed case uh, in the Netherlands, and then another two weeks for the intelligent lockdown, how they call it, in the Netherlands. And uh, at the same day, the WHO to announce that this COVID 19 that's the disease uh, outbreak uh, was a real uh, pandemic. And it took some more weeks to get 1 million confirmed cases. I will later talk about this, uh, the 29th of, uh, of April, um, where actually the first randomized trial was, uh, was shown. Uh, and uh, well, we now uh, hit almost 6 million cases. So that's the, the short timeline for now. And of course, uh, statistics are, uh, are everywhere, um, whether you like it or not. Uh, you get daily updates uh, in the national news. Uh, this was of, of, of Saturday, I think, and 96 uh, corona patients, six deaths, three uh, hospitalizations. There's no way to get around that. And if you look at the RVM uh, website, you can get a lot of extra data, a lot of graphs. Uh, and this is something uh, that might be interesting uh, to you. Uh, and of course, what we see is here is the, the number of newly admitted patients. Uh, and we see that, uh, well, the, the peak was somewhere in, in, uh, in March. Uh, and that, well, became a lot less until now, almost no new patients uh, are admitted in the hospital these days. So these are, of course, all data or all statistics uh, that you can find on the RVM website. Uh, and I'm sure uh, other people have shown you this, or you've, you've probably all seen this uh, very nice uh, um, website by Johns Hopkins University that shows a lot of the key figures uh, about, the, uh, about the coronavirus. We're now at 6.8 million uh, confirmed cases, about 400,000 uh, deaths or confirmed deaths uh, due to COVID. Um, and this is a, a website that I think uh, did uh, in this corona crisis a very good job in uh, in uh, depicting statistics and it was the financial times and what you see here it's very nice overview of the axis of death which they estimate um, and here we see uh, in the in the bottom left corner we see the netherlands we're almost around now uh, the level uh, that we don't have any more axis of death well, in Peru, uh, they, they still have uh, a very large axis of death. And of course, um, the statistics that I show you are actually public health statistics. Um, and those public health statistics uh, are, are used to monitor uh, disease outbreaks. Uh, and one of the uh, one of the things uh, people do with this statistics is to build transition models to see how the disease spread. Also to identify sources of outbreaks, the super spreading events, such as uh, uh, in our country, uh, probably um, uh, the, uh, the, the, south, the southern of the Netherlands uh, was, uh, had a super spreading event. And there's also contract, sorry, contact tracing uh, that is done. Uh, 
other reasons to do this type of uh, data analysis. Sorry, my computer is doing acting up weird, right? So um, other other reasons is the monitoring of hospitalizations and the ICU admissions, monitoring fatalities, uh, such as the case fatality rate, which is number of deaths divided by the confirmed number of cases. Uh, although you might argue that the infection fatality rate, which is the number of deaths divided by actual infections, is more interesting. But typically, we it's, it's easier, of course, to estimate the case fatality rate. And uh, last but not least, uh, monitoring uh, transition strategies. So the strategies that are uh, being put in place uh, for the lockdown, for example, and see how, how they affect uh, the spread of the disease. Um, of course, this public health data during a pandemic is, of course, for uh, the reason of public health. Uh, and it's also the main focus of media and, and public attention. And it's, it's super highly centralized. It's on a national level, we have the RITM and the GGD and the outbreak management team, uh, which all uh, monitor this or, or, uh, or, or even organize this uh, collection of data and also the analysis. Um, and one of the characteristics is that it's, it's extremely fast. So you get updates from the RVM every day. And one of the benefits they have is that they have a very good uh, data infrastructure. Now, of course, we can say, we can have discussions about whether all the data is very accurate. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to that uh, later. But, uh, of course, these, uh, I, I like this picture because uh, this, is, this is what I picture mentally when I think about coronavirus. It's the people in the hospital. And the data that I just showed are not so extremely relevant for people that are in the hospital. People in the hospital and medical doctors uh, have other questions. They have questions about how to diagnose diseases, why people have, uh, why some uh, patients have uh, blood clots uh, and, and others uh, do not. Uh, we're interested, of course, in, in understanding who dies and who doesn't die to prevent dying. And uh, we're interested, interested in um, understanding and, and finding therapies that work for people that actually have COVID. And if you have a background in epidemiology, you will recognize this as diagnostic questions uh, and etiology questions, so questions about cause and effect, prognosis questions, so what happens to the patient, uh, and uh, therapy patients, what happens to the patient if I intervene. Um, which is called in epidemiology, it's called the DEP model. So diagnosis, etiology, prognosis, and therapy. And just to give you a few examples of the questions that we still have. Uh, for example, what is the negative predictive value of uh, some diagnostic tests in individuals with flu-like uh, symptoms? Uh, a negative predictive value means the probability that somebody who is, has a negative result on this uh, test actually doesn't have COVID. That's a diagnostic question that we still uh, are still waiting for the answer. Other question, uh, which is more cause and effect, is well, what is the causal mechanism behind pulmonary embolisms we see in, in some of the COVID patients and, and not in others. Uh, prognosis uh, question, uh, one example uh, that I'm working on is, is which hospitalized patients are more likely to die or to go to the ICU. Of course, if we have that kind of information, we can, we can act early and prevent, hopefully, death. Um, and uh, another question is, uh, well, the treatment, uh, especially both the efficacy, so whether how well it works and how safe it is, uh, of the anti, uh, antiviral treatments, so, uh, such as hydrochloxychloroquine. Now, compared to uh, the public health data, uh, we're not directly interested in, in public health, we're interested in the suspected COVID-19 patient's health. That's also not uh, the main focus of, uh, of the media. Maybe therapy, uh, so these antiretroviral uh, therapies are an exception. And it's not centralized. So unlike 
uh, the, uh, the data collection for the public health, uh, the data collected for understanding uh, how uh, things work with people in the hospital is not centralized. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not even centralized on a hospital level. I will come back to that later. It's also relatively slow uh, compared to, uh, to our RVM data. Uh, and unfortunately, we often ha don't have existing data infrastructures that encourage collection uh, of large amounts of data uh, for scientific research. So back to the COVID timeline. There was Dr. Trump at, uh, who, who discussed or, or suggested in March, the 21st of March, that the hydro, uh, uh, hydro, <laughs> hydrochloroquine, sorry, um, would work, would probably work, would be a, the biggest game changer in the history of, uh, of medicine. Uh, and that the FDA uh, moved mountains. And of course, after this tweet and after he, he talked about this a lot, uh, a lot of people were uh, very hopeful of this uh, particular, uh, particular drug. And, um, but there was no evidence yet. But if you look at the number of publications that actually came out on the topic of uh, of, uh, of COVID, you can see an enormous rise in publications. And these are, these are enormous numbers. These are the number of publications per day. So in our peak uh, around uh, May, we, we had more than 900 publications about COVID, medical publications per day, which is huge. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have an answer to hydrochloroquine for a long time. Just, just for your reference point was when we had 1 million cases and after that the, the number, uh, well, rapidly increased. And it took until uh, a couple of weeks ago before we got the first real large study uh, into, the, um, uh, into the treatment, uh, it was published in The Lancet. Um, and that actually showed, uh, but we'll come back to that later, that uh, it, it uh, was uh, a dangerous uh, medicine. Now, um, there's a lot of complaining going on, including by me, but also uh, people that, that published about it. Uh, for example, Paul Glashew uh, pub uh, published this paper uh, in May also uh, in the BMJ. Uh, where he describes the waste in COVID-19 research, because I think a lot of people now agree that there's a lot of research going on, but they don't answer the, the right questions. And this is a quote, existing research infrastructure to enable collaboration and communication is extremely limited with system cracks made more apparent by the pace and the volume of COVID-19 research. Registries do not exist for most study types. When there is a global rush to research a disease, a centralized accessible portal hosted by the WHO, for example, of all ongoing research and synthesis would be invaluable. Of course, this is, uh, I imagine, this is something very alarming, especially for people outside of the field of medicine. Uh, practically saying that we don't have the right uh, tools to do uh, this very important uh, medical research. And it's very much the same, uh, so some evidence extra uh, came from our, our research where we did a systematic review and critical appraisal of, uh, of diagnostic and prognostic models, so part of this literature. And what we found is indeed very local, very small data sets which were generally unrepresentative. Very poor statistical modeling, very poor reporting, and all of the models we evaluated, there were 66 of them, were evaluated at a high risk of bias, which is not good, obviously. So none of these models that were 
developed to help guide uh, uh, clinical, uh, clinical work. And all of these models we would recommend for use. And I asked, I asked uh, Joyce to ask you to read this paper, which was uh, written by uh, Doc Altman, who uh, died uh, two years ago, almost exactly today. And he wrote this actually in 1994. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of what, what he's saying here applies to modern COVID uh, research as well. And he says, what should we think about a doctor who uses the wrong treatment, either willfully or through ignorance, or who uses right treatment wrongfully, as given by the wrong, uh, as, such as by giving the wrong dose of a drug? Most people would agree that such behavior was unprofessional, arguably unethical, and certainly unacceptable. What then should we think about researchers who use the wrong techniques, either willfully or in ignorance, use the right techniques wrongly, misinterpret their results, report their results selectively, cite the literature selectively, and draw unjustified conclusions. We should be appalled. Yet numerous studies of the medical literature in both general and specialist journals have shown that all of the above phenomena are common. This is surely a scandal. Which are, of course, very strong words uh, in a medical journal. And he goes on when he says, when I tell friends outside of medicine that many papers published in medical journals are misleading because of methodological weakness, like we showed, they are rightly shocked. Huge sums of money are spent annually on research that's seriously flawed through the use of inappropriate designs, unrepresentative samples, like we showed, again, small samples, like we showed, incorrect methods of analysis, like we showed, uh, and faulty, in, uh, faulty interpretation. Errors are so varied that a, wall, uh, that a whole book on the topic, valuable as it is, is not comprehensive. In any case, many of those who make the errors are unlikely to read it. And the best quote is probably the, the, the best sentence a, a paper ever started with, uh, which we should all hang on our walls probably. We need less research, not more research better research and research done for the right reasons. And there was a real scandal also, because the, uh, the article that I talked about, published in Lancet, uh, has been retracted last, uh, last week, talking about a real scandal. So the reason is, is because probably these data uh, didn't even exist. And retractions are not very uncommon, unfortunately, these days. Uh, a very nice uh, website to look or to, to monitor that is Retraction Watch. And uh, at this point, there are already 17 papers on COVID-19 that have been retracted, uh, which is a very high number. So of course, now you might question, is it all this bad? Is all science uh, broken? Of course, the answer should be no. There are good things that happen too. Uh, for example, one of the uh, best things that happened was probably the whole genome sequencing of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so already the Chinese on January 12th, they, uh, they did this genotyping, uh, which has been very, very important uh, for understanding the disease. Now this, little creature that also played an important role because pretty soon on we, or, or uh, at least there was very strong evidence by a large Chinese group published in Nature uh, that the pneumonia outbreak was associated with, uh, with bats. And this is one of the drugs, uh, Remdesivir. And, um, this was one of the first papers published uh, a randomized controlled trial, double blind, placebo controlled, uh, which means uh, rigorous. Uh, and what they found in the end was that 
for this particular drug, um, remdesivir was not associated associated with statistically significant clinical benefits, meaning uh, it probably doesn't work. Although the conclusion, of course, is a bit disappointing. Uh, it's very nice to have this kind of uh, kind of research to know what kind of drugs you should give and uh, which uh, you shouldn't. Um, well, of, co of course, the problem of this, uh, again, of this, uh, of this paper is that it was published only in April 29, and it still suggests that there's, uh, there's more research uh, that has to be done before we are really sure about, uh, about this particular drug. And then there was, of course, the, the other drug that we already talked about. The good news is, uh, after the, the, the scandal of, of the Lancet of last week, there was also a, a very nice paper uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it's, again, a randomized controlled trial. And what they show is that uh, the drug doesn't prevent illness uh, in... Uh, a, a pre pretty large 821 uh, participants uh, group. Of course, there are more trials going on. A lot of trials are going on. At this point, there are more than 2,000 or almost 2,000 uh, trials registered uh, on COVID-19, which are underway. And perhaps more surprisingly, there are more than 1,000 uh, systematic reviews that have been registered and are ongoing on um, COVID-19. Now, taking a step back, uh, this is a nice paper, uh, I think, uh, published in, uh, in, in Science by, uh, by London and Kimmelman, where they argue against pandemic research exceptionalism. And they say, although crisis presents major logistical and practical challenges, the moral mission of research remains the same, to reduce uncertainty and enable caregivers, health systems, and policymakers to better address individual and public health, rather than generating permission to carry out low uh, quality investigations, the urgency and the scarcity of pandemics heighten the responsibility of key actors in research in the research enterprise to coordinate their activities to uphold the standards necessary to advance this mission saying that it's very important even though we need these uh, uh, the, the, the science very quickly during the pandemic is very important to keep in mind also the quality uh, and one of the issues of course is that doing research doing scientific research what makes it a bit different than monitoring is if you do scientific research you come into you run into a lot of methodological problems and probably one of the biggest problems in uh, the research that we see uh, on COVID-19 is what we call selection bias which is simply illustrated by this example that has nothing to do with COVID so imagine you are interested in the relationship between acting ability and attractiveness. Now, if you look at the whole population, which are the blue dots and the red dots together, there's no association. Now, if you're gonna only look at the people that are successful actors, you might suddenly see a relationship. Why? It's because uh, very, uh, it, it, actors with a low uh, attractiveness probably are very good in acting. Well, if you're more attractive, it becomes less important. So you get a negative, a negative relationship. Well, the same holds uh, for a lot of research in COVID, especially if we're only gonna look at the people that are uh, hospitalized. So we only get the most uh, successful, in a sense, uh, patients successful in the sense that they're the most diseased now, of course we can get very strange association if we don't realize the fact that we're looking at the most severe cases and there are three other 
which are very common methodological challenges. First one is confounding. Uh, and all epidemiologists that are looking at this, of course, know confounding because that's uh, their main job, uh, which means lack of comparability. So comparing patients between each other to understand how the, how the disease uh, functions is complicated by people that have, for example, comorbidities. And comorbidities means that not every patient is alike. And we have to control that for not, that not, uh, not being alike. A second problem that we often face, and especially in, uh, in COVID-19 research, is measurement error and misclassification error. So one of the examples of that is that we don't have a gold standard test uh, to diagnose uh, COVID. And I think Professor van der Weigert has discussed this uh, in an earlier lecture in this series. And the third, again, very common uh, problem in um, COVID-19 data analysis is incomplete data, because not every COVID-19 patient going to the hospital undergoes the same workup, meaning they don't get the same blood test, they don't all uh, get a CT scan, for example. So you get incomplete data uh, when you try to compare different pa patients. And of course, traditionally, and I think this, 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 should be, this should be the case, a quality of data analysis and quality of data should trump uh, the speed of uh, analysis or the speed of science. But there are initiatives, of course, to increase the speed. Uh, probably uh, a lot of you have heard about MedArchive these days, which is a preprint server. So traditionally, uh, well, uh, manuscripts of, uh, of, of, of uh, scientific research, uh, also medical research, but for all types of research, uh, are submitted to a journal who does uh, a peer review of the article and you get feedback or you're rejected and you go to a new journal. In this case, MedArchive is a preprint server uh, where you can submit your paper, which will not be uh, peer reviewed, which is also highlighted in the, in, in the red, uh, by, by the red letters here, uh, will not be peer reviewed, but it, uh, it at least speeds up the process of getting it published. And of course, this is not the only a place where you then submit your paper, but you also submit it to a journal. So it's sort of a double uh, trajectory, if you will. So this is a uh, preprint, which has, up, has grown exponentially uh, during the COVID-19 uh, era um, to get new research quicker to uh, the medical professionals. Um, on the other hand, the journals have also been uh, changing because of the pandemic. They, there have been uh, fast-track peer review and editorial processes. I've been involved in one which took four days, which is lightning quick, because normally it takes uh, months before your paper gets through peer review uh, and, and sometimes years before it gets published. Another way, of course, of increasing uh, speed or discussions um, during this COVID area were on, on the social media and on blogs. So there are initiatives indeed to speed up uh, science. Now, and something that might, uh, might be uh, unbelievable for, uh, for some people who are not in, in medical science, um, of course, we all know we now have medical records, electronic medi me medical records, um, in most hospitals, but the, uh, the strange thing maybe is that these medical records are not accessible for uh, medical research, at least not directly in the Netherlands. Now, of course, this is something uh, we probably should want. We want to learn from uh, uh, previous uh, patients, previous COVID patients to improve our care for future patients. And one of the ideas uh, related to this is the so-called learning healthcare system. And the learning healthcare system, uh, the, the idea behind this is that you indeed learn from the cases. 
Uh, so get data, analyze that data, interpret data, get feedback to, uh, to the clinicians, change your policy, and then again, look at, look at the data. Uh, this, this is not easy because it involves many stakeholders from healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, patients, epidemiologists, statisticians, data scientists, bioinformaticians, ethicists, uh, very important, lawyers, basic scientists, data managers, and inf uh, information technologists to get such a system uh, from the ground. So this is one reason, of course, why we do not yet do that. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm going to end my uh, presentation by saying it's not that we don't try. Uh, there are now a lot of data initiatives, including ISERIC, uh, Capacity, Open Safely, COVID Predict, and COVID Precise, which are, we, which are trying to get as much data uh, as quick as possible. But of course, we're now beyond the 6 million uh, people, uh, 6 million infections. Uh, so, so probably, we, in, at least in, in future pandemics, we should act a bit faster. So this was uh, my talk. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm, uh, I'm a bit fast, so we have uh, time for uh, questions. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question? And you can indicate in the chat and then we can um, give you the opportunity to ask your question. I see first one, Michael. Um, I will unmute you so you can ask your question directly. You should. Okay, I'm not sure there may be a technical challenge. I can read that out loud. Um, he thanks you for a fantastic lecture. And then he wonders, how do you think, um, what is the importance of retrospective studies? Can we use them to compare treatment and decide which is better? Or should we implement into practice only evidence based on less biased research? So uh, I wouldn't say that retrospective analysis are typically, are, are always biased. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, the ideal setting for a, uh, for a treatment is a randomized controlled trial. And I think we don't do that enough and not, we don't do it fast enough. Um, so of course, uh, for, uh, for some of the, the, uh, the treatments I discussed, uh, it's easy to set up a trial relatively, um, but we don't do that. We typically first look at, uh, at, uh, at large cohorts, which I also think when analyzed properly, uh, and especially when there are large amounts of data and analyzed properly, taking into account all these methodological issues, uh, they can result in pretty fast uh, data that we need uh, that is sufficient probably to act upon, waiting for, for trial results typically. Does that answer the question? Uh, Michael, if um, does this answer your question? You can indicate in the chat. Um, if not, we can come back to you. Yes, thank you, he says. Um, Wilhelm, uh, Wilhelm, you also have a question. Would you like to ask yours? Well, again, there seems to be an issue with the unmuting settings, so I can ask it for you. Can you say something about how much statistical training medical students get? Do they know enough or do they rely on specialists like you? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I've, I've been, uh, it, it has been a couple of years since I've been active in education of medical doctors. Um, so I have to be careful here. Um, but my, my view is, uh, which I've also shared on Twitter, so you can, can find it there too. So I probably can say it here too, is I think that a lot of education in, uh, in medical schools is uh, focused on uh, learning uh, tricks, learning uh, statistical tricks, and uh, learning statistical software, which, in my view, is not the key thing that medical professionals should know. Because I think, well, let's say 90% of the medical students will not do medical research. Uh, and we need less research, so that's good. Um, but what they do 
need to know is statistical thinking and critical appraisal. It's two things. So statistical thinking means understanding the basic principles behind statistical analysis and critical appraisal means understanding, being able to critically uh, read uh, papers and reflect on them. I think these are the two things we should focus on more. But that's just me. Well, maybe I can actually add being trained as a medical doctor and an epidemiologist after, um, because I would like to strongly, well, echo your, or support your, um, your observation. Um, a lot about, a lot in doing good research is understanding what your research question is and what are the methods to address this question. Um, and I also think medical doctors are good at being medical doctors. Um, but there is, is a separate skill that methodologists and biostaticians have, um, which actually calls for more collaboration. And in order to exactly. have effective collaboration, it is important that you understand each other's um, base, basic assumptions or speak the same language, at least from a, the foundations. And that's where basic training in epidemiology, but also statistics may come in place. Um, but one of the things that is most important is to know also the limits of your knowledge and that's what also basic training can provide so that you are better able to identify when you do need to collaborate with others yeah uh, and willem um agrees with both of us um he's a geostatistician uh yeah. that's a whole other field that i well for my clinical social epidemiology would not know much about for example no. anyone else who we can give the floor for a question. Yes, Tristan, I will try if I can unmute you, see if the technical issue has been solved. Otherwise, yes, you should be able to ask your question yourself if you want to now. Otherwise, I can ask your question for you. Maybe that's easier. Um, so uh, he asks, what is your, uh, what your opinion is or a vision on a national or even international um, levels um, and international may be facilitated or supervised by WHO. Um, and he asks you what your opinion is about this national international data collection uh, of healthcare um, data in one system. Um, is it uh, worth the research potential this has uh, or in spite of potential privacy issues? So uh, I, I think um, it, it's a very important question, of course. Uh, I think um, at least on a national level, we should do better. The fact that we're still trying to get data um, to analyze, to understand COVID, uh, is, in, in my view, unacceptable. Uh, the fact that we cannot access medical records, uh, even in our own hospital, to analyze uh, our patients, to provide better, case, uh, better uh, care to patients, um, is unbelievable. But the way, the way we have to move forward, of course, is uh, not open everything. I mean, privacy is a real thing, ethics is a real thing, uh, and we should probably work uh, again, uh, multidisciplinary, uh, to fix this this problem. So I think this problem already starts in hospital level. It also is. It's it's also something uh, we should think about. Is if if there's a pandemic, don't we want some kind of supervision, uh, like the monitoring data, where. Uh, well, the, somebody is responsible for coordinating the research nationally. Uh, and I think um, what is interesting is that at some point the WHO opened a, sort of a website to, uh, to, to share your medical data and suddenly it disappeared, uh, which is interesting. Uh, so apparently we're not in the situation yet uh, and, and part of that is uh, ethics, part of that is privacy. Uh, we're not in the situation yet where we actively share data. That's also the, the point 
that was made in the BMJ, uh, BMJ paper about waste. We're not there yet. Um, and uh, I think for the next pandemic or maybe the, the, the second wave, I hope we're better prepared, but I'm not sure that, that we will be. It's not a very positive thing to say, but that's, that's how I, I think about it. I'm not sure what I actually answered the question. Yes, and there is actually a follow-up question um, by Giorgio uh, Totarella. Um, he's wondering if there currently are any publicly available data sets uh, with especially medical data that people outside of academia can access and use for self-study or statistical analysis. Um, as, far, as far as I know, very limited, unless you're looking for uh, imaging data. So CT scans, uh, those are widely shared on Kaggle, for example, um, which is a website that, that, uh, that does uh, a lot of machine learning. Uh, it's done for people that do machine learning and, and try to analyze those, those images. But real patient level data uh, is very hard to get to. So there are these initiatives that I just discussed uh, where as a, as a researcher, you can actually apply. You can also apply, for example, in Utrecht with uh, capacity, COVID capacity. Um, and, and you can get data there, but you have to apply. I think that's, that's everywhere. You have to have some kind of uh, idea, research idea, hypothesis. You have to, to sort of argue your way into the data. But just getting data that's, um, as far as I know, but please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that's, not, that's not available. There are in other fields uh, a few examples um, of data infrastructure that actually established um, with data sharing in mind. For example, demographic health survey systems, which is a global network of especially research sites in low middle income countries. They collect lots of data that you as a researcher can apply to use. And yes, you do need to motivate why, but it's a yeah. very good model that could work maybe even for coronavirus um, as well. The other thing that Martin maybe, well, I, if you allow me to add another type of scientists we may need are behavioral scientists yep. because there is also a culture in academia and and that we want to keep our data to ourselves and the the culture of sharing and kind of making use of each other's expertise and, and recognize that together you can accomplish more um, is not ne necessarily ingrained in how we are being trained or how we're being rewarded um, in incentive wise so that may be another um, thing that we as scientists need to consider um, and this links also to an another question by Jose Andres uh, Galvache, if I pronounce your name correctly. Um, he actually points out that there is um, a, well, that we are fortunate, we, I say now as an epidemiologist within the UC Utrecht, that I can call you and just ask, hey, Martin, can you please think along? Because I have a tough question that I cannot solve. Um, but he's wondering what about places where we want to do uh, less research and good research, but we do not have a good team in place. Where can we find statistical friends um, that we all need? Um, so could you reflect on this? How, where can you find statistical friends if you don't have one in your own institution necessarily? Statistical friends. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I think that's a good question. Uh, so um, uh, one of the issues, of course, that for, for statisticians is, uh, and for data scientists and for epidemiologists, who we'll all have a particular skill in, uh, in doing data analysis, um, is that they're rare. And that's, uh, that's good for us. Um, but on the other hand, of course, in, in some settings, uh, you might not have access to anyone. Of course, there's Twitter, uh, so you can, uh, you can ask me anything and I will probably respond to it. There are also fora, uh, but of course this doesn't, uh, this doesn't solve everything. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I don't have a direct answer to this problem because many of the statisticians and epidemiologists are all researchers. 
uh, and they have to, uh, they're already busy. Uh, so it's, 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 and, and uh, money is limited and, and that kind of, that kind of things. Uh, so, so a very simple solution, uh, I don't think I can give, except by pointing out that there's a lot of, um, information out there on the internet, uh, on Twitter. Uh, but also, uh, for example, uh, Frank Harrell has a has an online course now. We can learn a lot. Uh, Frank Harrell also has a, a sort of a help page, um, which you can access. is all all so free, and a lot of statisticians will will react to you. So this would be one way, probably, in which we can, uh, as a sort of a community, uh, can help. And this links also to Dennis Smiga's um, question. He was, is wondering if you can recommend um, readings um, uh, or other resources for someone who wants to start diving deeper into the topic of medical health statistics. Um, and you mentioned a few already. Um, maybe I can invite you to actually make a Twitter thread about this so everyone can, yeah. um, because probably from the top of your head, well, there are many more resources. Uh, so follow us on Twitter. I will, I will think about it and I will uh, post something tomorrow. Yeah. Oh. That's fast. Thank you. Oh. Um, ah, yeah, Dennis appreciates the idea. Um, and Canon is wondering if you can include in it the link to the website course that you just mentioned. Yeah, well. Um, there, oh, there was a question about um, pooling of case reports. Uh, Matt um, observes that in COVID-19, sometimes patients present with unique symptoms. Um, for example, in certain patient groups, like children uh, presenting with vasculitis-like symptoms, what is the best methodology to pull, combine these case reports together and interpret, draw conclusions from this type of data? Uh, that's a very, very difficult and very technical question. Um, and uh, of course, case reports, uh, what, what we typically want uh, for research, what, what is our ideal? Uh, and I'm talking, of course, at a as a statistician, uh, which may sound like an ivory tower. Um, but ideally, we want consecutive patients. So patients that come to the doctor uh, for a particular reason, uh, and we get all of those patients. And case reports are typically uh, are special cases, so to say. Uh, and a lot of special cases, uh, you might still run into this selection bias problem that I talked about, which is very hard. Um, the second part of my answer uh, to it is, is that I'm not an expert in this uh, particular field. So case reports, combining case reports, uh, I have not seen a lot of uh, methodological work on this. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm the, the right person to, to directly answer the question uh, how, um, how to do it and how to uh, account for this problem of uh, selection bias that you, might, uh, that you might encounter. Thank you. Uh, another methodological question uh, is from uh, Alejandra. Um, she thanks you for your presentation and she's wondering what lessons we, uh, you think we should take from this COVID-19 outbreak regarding good quality data collection, not only of RCTs, but to be able to do more real world data studies. Mm. Yeah, um, so I think uh, the, the lesson we should learn is that we should have a data infrastructure ready in times of pandemics. Uh, so. A lot of data from, uh, for example, uh, the, the south of the Netherlands, a lot of patients we will never see because these data were not collected for research purposes. We will never see them. Uh, and in my mind, it should be possible to get the, the data that is in, already in computer systems about all these patients uh, accessible for research purposes. And this is something I think should have uh, top priority. Uh, from the leaders in our field uh, to indeed get these data uh, accessible for quick research, quick, high quality still uh, research. But the problem now is with the data. Getting the data is uh, 
the, the slowing the slowing down factor. Uh, and I think this uh, it's 2020. This shouldn't be a uh, a slowing factor. Thank you, Marta. I also have a question because there's of course a lot of patients and they also report things and they can write their own stories. And I know there's already research also on patient stories, how they like diaries or medical uh, scripts that people give and they do research from that. And besides that, you of course also have, have Apple and all the people that wear their watches and also has medical data on it. How are those uh, data connected to the to the research? And yeah, can can this also help with the COVID pandemic? I think that that's a very good question. And, uh, I think we, we in, in the Jewish Center we just got a very large grant to find this out, whether to see whether wearables, for example, so that's 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 well high volume data, uh, big data, some people call it can be used effectively to uh, to understand the disease um, but this is something i haven't seen a lot it's not traditional medical research of obviously uh, and some methodological work has to be done there too to to ensure that we're not we're not making a fool of ourselves and so we have to understand how to analyze those data and that's 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 not something that's that's easy And the patient stories, how is that? Do you think that's process, processing in the future that by computer, like artificial intelligence that, that they can, yeah. I also heard like for, in, that's not the patient stories, but like if you have that Google how home thing and it, it listens to you how many times you cough or something, then it can target you as a, as a, suspected COVID uh, patient? Uh, I, I think uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things in, uh, that, that is happening right now in, in the artificial intelligence world is uh, where they use speech, indeed. Speech, I think, to diagnose Parkinson's, uh, which is a very interesting thing. But again, this is something that has to be developed. Methods have to be developed uh, and we have to see um, how well that that will work in the future uh, but this is um, actually my sort of my suggestion for now is that we first fix the simple data so to say uh, the electronic health record data I, I think we should have access to that part of the data before we start thinking about wearables and patient stories which are are, are way more difficult to analyze probably much more uh, much richer in some sense, uh, but very difficult. Thank you. Uh, one last question from Ingenin. Thank you for the great lectures. Do you have some specific insight into how policies might in the future be able to work out the privacy issues to access medical data for research? Yeah, so, so like I said, I think I'm not an expert in ethics or in, I'm not into, so this is, this is not typically not my, my expertise. But what I know is that there are initiatives going on to sort of scramble up the data just enough to ensure people are protected. But still good enough to do data analysis. I think that is one very interesting uh, way. Another way is uh, I think we should think about how to uh, how to analyze data in safe uh, analysis environments, uh, where researchers can only do so much with the data and pre-planned. Uh, so I think we can do both from the sort of the data scrambling part and the the platforms that we have to do data analysis, we can do much better than we're currently doing. And what we're currently doing is, of course, doing a lot of analysis on our personal laptops. And it's, I think we should move away from that into safer, safer environments. Hey, it's 
past eight. So I think with this last question, we do need to wrap up um, this lecture as well as the full series. Um, Martin, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, everyone who watched, thank you for joining us as well. Um, follow Martin on Twitter if you want to know and learn more about these resources he's posting tomorrow. Um, and have a very good evening. And maybe should you promote Uglobe? Oh, oh yes, it's Rose Gofford. Um, tomorrow at 2.30, we have a Uglobe meeting where we are gonna talk about the future of uh, healthcare. And there will be students from all over the world going into discussion. So if you are interested, uh, Joyce will now put the link into the uh, <laughs> I'm looking for it at, as we speak. Marta, can I ask you one more question? Sure. Because we're the there's also that Lancet uh, paper about reducing uh, waste and yeah. uh, the one that Beer and Pak is always using and Frank Miedema are yeah. It's a series, yeah. 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 The, the, um, the research waste series, yes. Yeah. But how do you think, like, with the money, because money is still going to a lot of research that doesn't work. How, how do you think the system would work with, like, how can we do better research with better money? Do you see a solution? Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult. Uh, yeah, sorry. I think if, <laughs> if, I, if I know the answer, I will get a Nobel Prize. Yeah. Uh, or I think I should earn a Nobel Prize. Um, I, I think it's very difficult uh, because a lot of research uh, is done indeed um, that, is, that is, in a sense, wasteful. So, wasting, wasting uh, money and wasting time uh, to answer no questions, no relevant questions. Um, as, uh, and that, that is something very difficult. Uh, can we reduce it? Probably. Probably by, uh, uh, by a stronger, uh, stronger peer review, for example. I think there's too much papers published that shouldn't go through peer review. Uh, and I think it will, a lot of, a lot of poor research is also published in high impact journal so that's still the incentive for people to to go into uh, to, to do not so good research and publish it still uh, in, in high journals so i think there's a lot of power in the in the high impact journals yeah but like frank Miedema and Pierre pak they say that patient engagement would also um, solve the the problem is it but it's not like private money i mean it's still the f not the private funds that that sponsor all the research it's it's more the government and the who and the nih that sponsor so how can we get that shift in more patient engagement and as like answering the questions that really matter so i, th I think there's a lot of I think patient engagement is really important. I mentioned to patients during uh, at, at the uh, the, uh, the part of my uh, my presentation. I think they're very important and, and they can help us prioritize. But also, a lot of research is done on existing data sets um, and done very quickly. And unfortunately, in the Netherlands, for example, we have a culture where. A lot where, where PhD students have to have at least six or seven or eight papers uh, instead of uh, one or two very good ones. Um, and uh, and I, th I don't think that system uh, is working very well. I'm not saying this is, this is, this is the problem of the, of this, of this PhD students. It's the problem of we, of our, we as supervisors, expecting a lot of output. Uh, and we're still, of course, as uh, as scientists, we're, we're, we're not really ranked on quality, we're ranked on, on output numbers. Uh, and I think that is also what Frank Minema is saying, is we, should, uh, we should do that much less. Um, For those who read Dutch, I will post the blog of a historian, Suze Zelstra, who is, I think, an example of how we scientists should be um aspire to be um and she just quit 
academia um, for all the reasons we, well, in academia, we know exists in academia. Um, it's a recommended read for everyone. It also points towards a way forward. If we fix our, our system, we may also have better research as a result. Academia is also fun, by the way. <laughs> well, that's why we, we do, <laughs> we're still here. That's yeah. true. <laughs> Thank you, Maarten. Maybe you. we can switch to Dutch now. Oh, ja, we're, ja. Zijn er nog vragen van degene die, want er zitten nog 42 mensen in de... Ja, we... Ja. Or in English, because I do see international names too. So if you have questions, I want to, yeah, we're just hanging out here. Um, or just say thank you to uh, Maarten. <laughs> Many thank yous. Klaas just turned on his camera. Can I ask a question? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh okay. my. Ah. I'm just wondering, um, talking about research, not giving the right answers, are the right questions ever posed? <laughs> so isn't it just a matter of having the good questions instead of having all sorts of research, all sorts of research by researchers not answering any well-defined question. It's just, just, just it it's not my job. No, thanks, Dad. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, this, this, the, yeah, this is a problem. Of course, this, the, the, the real problem is, is that we don't, uh, that, that the real questions that we have during this pandemic are very difficult to answer. Uh, so there either, are no stupid questions. Uh, well, you can have well. <laughs> can have stupid questions. Definitely. That's what we have to teach the students to always <laughs> ask questions. They cannot be stu stupid. In learning process. <laughs> there are no stupid questions, but it's, for articles, there are. <laughs> talking about students, <laughs> what okay. I use when when I work, I always said um, the solution is not the problem. The problem is the problem. To have a, the, the right problem posed and then find out what you have to research is far more difficult than to have a hunch and just go researching. That's a bit of my feeling that one of the reasons a lot of research potential is wasted is because nobody is there to have the authority to ask the right question. Maybe, but that's my feeling. But a, a lot of research I, 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 I've en encountered. Yeah, I think uh, I think we agree. I mean, uh, oh my goodness, we agree. Yeah. <laughs> Famous quote by Einstein: "If I had one hour to solve a problem, I would spend fifty-five minutes um, about the problem and five minutes thinking about a solution." Uh, maybe Einstein was even better than me. <laughs> Okay, that was my question. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Anyone I else? I thought talking five, 55 minutes with my dad would solve <laughs> the question. <laughs> <laughs>